Hello and welcome to episode 12 of the Chicago Business Podcast, uh, where we'd like to introduce leading executives in the Chicagoland area and learn about their, uh, both their background uh, in terms of their business and their uh, professional experience as well as uh, learn about them as people as well. I am your host, Drew Sakula, and today we welcome Denise Castellino, an Executive Vice President with AECOM with responsibility for the Chicagoland market. Uh, amongst others, I'm sure we'll, yeah, we'll get into that. Uh, AECOM is a Fortune 500 company with over $20 billion in annual revenues, and they are a premier fully integrated infrastructure and support services firm. Welcome, Denise. How are you this afternoon? Pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. Great. Happy to have you on. Thank you for joining. Thanks for having me. Great. So, um, Maybe to start, if we can, uh, yeah, maybe if you could fill us in on, on, on your, your background. I know you've been with uh, AECOM for quite some time, but if you, if you could, uh, and I know you've been, uh, you spent a long time in Chicago, so we'd like to have, uh, yes. guests <laughs> to have uh, you know, those, those deep ties. So uh, if you could uh, maybe uh, fill us in on your origin story and talk about your ties to Chicago, we can start there. Okay. So I'm a, um, a degree civil engineer, and when I first uh, got out of school, worked for a design firm in the city, and then um, I met my husband, <laughs> and which we have two wonderful children who are out of the house now. And then, um, and then I worked to work for chemical waste management, and I actually was in the environmental field. Um, and then I had an opportunity to work for the city of Chicago. And I was in three departments there, where I was in the transportation department, where I did the Wacker Drive reconstruction project. Um, then Mayor Daly sent me to the building department. And from there, I was the planning commissioner. And then when that tour was over, I came back to um, AECOM. Um, and I've been here for 15 years. And I've done a lot here, I did a lot of transportation but the exciting thing that I've been doing the past few years is um, AECOM realized, like most companies, that all of everything's happening in urban areas in a big way. And as an infrastructure firm, it's obviously a key focus for us. So we have what's called a National Cities Program. So in addition to Chicago, um, I have other cities under my um, purview, which include New York, Philadelphia, um, Toronto is getting off the ground, um, Detroit, Dallas, and um, Houston, as well as Denver. So, um, and there's other counterparts that have other, you know, cities in the country, but um, that's my focus area. And it's, um, it's very cool because what I'm selling is everything that, um, that AECOM does. So we can really come up with some neat solutions for our clients, you know, because we have the the background in transportation and water, environment, energy, architecture, you know, as well as the construction arm. So who are your clients then? Who, who are the customers of? Uh, um, depending on, you know, what we're doing with infrastructure, those are generally public clients, you know, so the city of Chicago DOT, the water department, the planning department, the state of Illinois, the county, the tollway, um, those are our big transportation clients. Um, the same thing with water. You know, water is generally done at a municipal level. So um, we have a lot of municipal water clients. Um, architecture and environment have both, right? We do a lot of private work, especially on the environmental side, um, work for utilities. So we have, you know, we have the whole gamut of, um, of things that really affect your everyday life. Like when you turn on the light switch or flush your toilet, we're, <laughs> we're doing somehow part of that with AECOM, so. Right. So uh, I understood that uh, you guys also got involved a little bit in some of the COVID uh, uh, relief efforts in terms of building out McCormick Place back when you've been talking uh, for some time now, but uh, th that seems like forever ago. I know, right? A couple months back, right? Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. We were part of that for the city, um, which was which was really incredible. I was um, as somebody who's lived in Chicago all my life. Um, I was so proud of the way all of the agencies have come together um, against COVID. You know, you had the city of Chicago, the Department of Health, 
you had Illinois Department of Health, you had the county, um, everybody really worked together on that. I mean, that was just so wonderful to see. I think everybody checked their egos and said, we've got to, um, you know, we've got to fight this for our, for our residents. And I think they, you know, they're doing a great job. I mean, it, nobody knew what was, you know, <laughs> changes all the time, right? What the, what the medical, uh, what the medical people are telling us, we learn things, but very flexible and, um, you know, they're just, uh, they're out there to do the right thing. And it was so great to see. Right. Right. Um, so what are some of the other, uh, projects in Chicago that you have, uh, that you guys have been focused on over the last, uh, um, I don't know, last year or two? Um, one of them that's, uh, we're really proud of is the two bridges down at, um, in uh, Hyde Park and Oakwood, Kenwood there. They're the PED bridges at 41st and 43rd Street. Um, the 43rd Street bridge we're working on now, the 41st Street bridge has been open. And actually it's won 18 awards because it's just a, it's a, you know, it's won the ENR big national award. And, um, you know, that's more than just a bridge project. So when the city started out doing all of these, these projects on South Lakeshore Drive, it was about getting connection for communities that hadn't had connection before, right? So now connects a whole, whole all these neighborhoods totally to the lakefront, which is incredible to see safely. And, and it's a beautiful bridge to look at on top of that. So um, that's a really cool project. That's when, that's one of those projects where um, it's a bridge that does so much more, you know. Um, the other big one um, we're working on is the uh, Jane Byrne Interchange, you know, which has taken a while, but it's going to be fantastic when it's done. <laughs> um, some previous stuff like that I was involved with is the runway 10C, 28C out at O'Hare, which is one of the um, one of the first category six runways here, which, um, you know, the ultimate plan for O'Hare is to have the six parallel east-west runways. Um, so that's pretty cool because that's, um, you know, building at O'Hare is kind of like Wrigley Field where you are right in a neighborhood, <laughs> as you know, and it's, um, time, you know, space is really important. So you really have to coordinate and, you know, do things right to get that done. Right. So are you guys doing, is it like design and build type of, uh, type of work? Then? So, yeah, so we do planning and design and we'll do construction management. Okay. And then we do have a, a building arm here in Chicago, um, A. Comp Hunt, which really um, plays in the vertical space. So um, they're one of the contractors who will be out at O'Hare for the new terminals. So, you know, they do more vertical buildings as opposed to the horizontal infrastructure work. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. So is there a mm -hmm. lot of, um, I mean, what kind of vendors then are you engaging and who are the, yeah, who are the potential uh, other counterparties that would, would get involved uh, to be kind of your suppliers? Um, you mean who would who do we team with that kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, right. Oh, okay. Well, we have a lot of partners. Um, we have a lot of uh, DBE partners. We're really really big into mentoring a lot of DBEs. We have a lot of success stories there. So, for instance, on um, another really cool job that we're proud of is 55 and Lakeshore Drive. Those bridges were really in rough shape. They're all curved steel structures, and we. Um, Robinos and Messia, RME, we brought them along as one of our DBE partners. And prior to the start of the project, they were um, only qualified, um, they had an IDOT prequal just for simple bridges. And after working with us on that, they designed one of the curved steel structures. So now they have an additional qualification with the state from working with us. So we really love what, you know, the DBE program, we we dive into it to make it the most for our partners because they're there, you know, they're there to learn from us. And that's what, you know, that's what we do. That's what, that's what we really consider a successful, you know, mentor protege project. And what, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the acronym, the DBE. Can you? Oh, I'm sorry. Disadvantaged business enterprise. Okay. Right. So there's DBEs and then there's uh, 
they call them minority business enterprises, MBE. The city uses MBE and WBE, um, women-owned business enterprises. Right. So are those are those both considered part of DBE then? Yes. Yeah. Right. Nice. Yeah, I know that there's a certain amount of work uh, is kind of held for those purposes. And it's great that uh, we can kind of mentor some of those businesses along and help them uh, help them reach new heights along with uh, uh, with everyone out there. So um, so that's great. So bridges is a big uh, is a big deal um, for for rehabbing. And I think that there's you know, you get a fair amount of uh, complaints about that as well. What would you say the <laughs> yeah. state of kind of bridges are in Chicago? Is that one of the most urgent uh, areas of or yeah? Look at well, prioritization. What what are your uh, what are your big uh, big big ticket items? Well, I think um, what, the thing that we've been really working with and working with our partners on is. Um, City and state budgets right now, as you can imagine, thanks to the pandemic, are in rough shape. And infrastructure is, you know, potentially one of those things that they're not going to have all the dollars to spend on that they want to, even though the needs are so great. So um, last week we held an event um, with AECOM virtually. So this was with all of a with a bunch of our DBE partners, and we hosted it with um, RCC, which is um, Resilient Cities. So they are a um, a spinoff from the Hundred Resilient Cities that the Rockefeller Foundation did a couple of years ago. So what we did was we partnered with them. Um, we had one Central with us, or um, I'm sorry, one Chicago fund with us, um, and then we had a bunch of our DBE partners, and what we did was we had a hackathon virtually, which is um, which is kind of fun. I don't know if you're, pro I mean, all of this virtual stuff now thanks to the pandemic, you actually can have a whiteboard with stickies virtually <laughs> where everybody puts their ideas on the board, right? right? So we challenged the group and said, how can we recover even smarter with infrastructure? One, how can we spend the dollars better, right? And then two, how can we get more benefits about it? So instead of just paving, but you know, when you reconstruct the road, make sure you have fiber that addresses the digital divide. because That's a big thing that came out of the pandemic. Um, do they want bike lanes? Do they want the road to be smarter, more, you know, better guidance on the road? And then on top of that, like the drainage, if you put in green infrastructure, can you also put permeable pavement that helps with, um, health and fitness on empty lots in the city, let's say. So there's, so we, it was a great session. You know, we had our DBE partners, we had these other um, uh, civic partners. You know, there was some other ex city people like me there and we really brainstormed, we had three groups. So we're compiling kind of our comments to, you know, to talk to the city about it, to talk to the mayor's office about it now, it's budget season to talk to, um, yeah, um, you know, op-eds to get the word out there that we're here to help cities figure out how to how to recover better with infrastructure because we feel as an industry you know we have this knowledge and we can help cities and states recover better through infrastructure we can be part of the solution yeah it's such a challenging time that we find ourselves in it seems because you know, with things shut down, it's like the perfect time to get some some of these projects done. <laughs> right, right. So right. We have so the money? Out exactly, yeah, <laughs> what to do. And then from a resource perspective, we also have some available resources out there in terms of it'd be great to put people to work, you know, but right, trying right. to balance all those things. Is, yes, uh, yeah, yeah, yes. I don't, I don't envy the decisions they all have to make. <laughs> right, right. And then not only that, but then try to get the state and federal folks. How how much how involved does the federal government get in the projects that uh, you guys get involved in? I guess all over the place, probably in some cases. Yeah, I mean, you know, pro projects are funded. Some are funded at the federal level, and down. You know, the states or the city has to match. Some are funded at the state level and down. 
county level, you know, there's all different types of, uh, of funding sources based on the type of project, you know, all those things. Yeah, seems like we're probably some uh, ways away from, uh, yeah, federal and well, who knows, who knows how far between federal and state officials being able to work together in a in a cohesive yeah. manner, but. Uh, you know, right. probably, probably, probably not in the next couple of months, but who knows? After. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who knows what the world's going to look like. So, all right. Uh, tell me a little bit about your uh, AECOM's workings with, um, with kind of organized labor and, and, and with the, with the trades. Um, that's not really, we don't really have direct, direct work that way. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I mean, they're part of projects, but it's not something that we hire, you know. Uh -huh. So our contracting arm does do um, does do work that way, but they generally sub out the work, you know. So we don't um, we don't own we don't have the equipment and labor under AECOM. We sub that work out. Right. So that's how we do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then from um, I mean cities. And you talked a little bit about being kind of urban focused. Is there, um, is there anything that you do outside of urban cores or it, it's really? Oh yeah. yeah. No, we do. I mean, our offices are generally in all of the metropolitan areas, but we'll work statewide, you know, on projects connecting city to city for those, for those expressways, those, you know, some of that water stuff. Um, and I think, you know, fiber is gonna be the other big thing. This digital divide is a big deal. because It's not only in urban areas, it is in rural areas as well. So that's gonna to have to be solved. You know, yeah, the pandemic I, really showed that. Yeah, I, I guess I don't, I don't fully understand the, uh, the answer to that problem because I've been out in, yeah, a number of different rural areas at different times um, and, you know, even, even like the satellite, a lot of people have satellite and stuff and it's just, that's not all that reliable or fast or, or right. good. Right. right. <laughs> so, yeah, trying to, uh, there's disadvantaged communities, I guess, both the inner city and uh, out in the rural areas, but that uh, getting the high speed access to everyone, you know, is, yeah, probably arguably the most important thing that we can do, right? Right. Right. It is. It's like, it's, you know, it's a utility that is just as important as, as the others at this point. Yep. So what is, um, you know, how, how does AECOM then get, get involved in that? And what, what is, what is uh, your role to play in that? So we, um, you know, we can do the whole thing. We can, uh, if a, if an internet service fiber provider, um, chooses to hire us we can do everything from citing where it's coming from you know whether it's coming from cables in the ocean frankly all the way to you know getting it to somebody's front door so um we can design what the fiber should look like um you know the size of it how to get it through urban areas uh the whole gamut of that you know some some companies will just hire you for the environmental because that can be a big environmental issue, you know, where the fiber is going to go through to get to wherever it has to get to. And then, um, and then once it gets into the city, you can imagine what it's like, you know, you open up any road in the city, <laughs> there's everything in there, right? There's water, sewer, the other utilities, and now you want to add fiber to the mix. So it's, um, and everybody wants their degrees of separation as well as their security. So those are challenging ones. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, just having dug up some of my front yard because of a water main uh, break, I, I, I could feel for you there. It's like, yeah, you right. Get on the gas lines, and the next thing. Uh huh. You know. <laughs> yep. But uh, yeah, in the middle of a city, it's uh, all that and more. So mm -hmm. the only thing similar is probably the uh, gravel that they backfilled it with. So. <laughs> um, nice. Nice. So, uh, okay. 
there, uh, so with COVID-19 and, and kind of the impact on, on the business, you know, um, cities and municipalities, it seems like have probably been challenged like, well, certainly like never before. And, um, you know, from a resource perspective, that's one thing. And then just for day-to-day, -day, uh, well, yeah, for, 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 for getting work done. I mean, are you seeing certain mm -hmm. things? pulled forward and pushed off or how, how, how has that impacted, you know, the projects that you've had? You know, the, the impacts haven't been great yet. I think everybody's, um, and it's probably now waiting for the election, but you know, how much are the feds going to help with the budgets? What is that going to, you know, do for projects? Um, transit, you know, obviously fare collection is low right now. Um, I still feel like we're in a, a Kind of a sorting out period you know which is why we're looking at things as how you know how can these budgets be spent better to get more bang for their buck you know i think everybody's everybody's got to work together that's in the right of way to to have successful projects to get more out of them you know and the everybody can't put blinders on with their budgets but work together Right. Yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, quite the conundrum everybody faces right now because there's so much work that does, that obviously needs to happen. Yes. And, and, you know, and we know we got to do it, right? And then there's, you know, but things need to be paid for as well. And certainly here in Illinois, we have, uh, you know, our more challenges than most, I guess. Um, you know, yes. So. Yes. So I, I see we uh, we jumped right over the beverage of the day, but I still have it here. So I was told that uh, Diet Coke was what you wanted. Uh, was <laughs> your choice, right? I have mine. Yeah. I, in my uh, AECOM holder. Nice, nice. <laughs> you know, and you brought a can. That's even better. I did. A little one, though. Just a little one. Oh, the little one. Okay. <laughs> I love these little guys, you know. I, right? I still don't understand why you can't get these at like every corner. They still force you into the the big uh, 20 ounce ones for some reason. I know, I know. <laughs> I like those. <laughs> oh, nice. So, uh, very good. The, um, yeah, so in terms of the overall environment though and getting things done, what do you, what do you see between now and, in and, in the election time or the election, is there really anything that can get done in infrastructure, at least from a, that requires federal uh, involvement or is that really on hold? You just have to work uh, locally and, and until then and, and see what happens on the other side. Well, I mean, there's still just the normal budget, right? But what's needed is something above and beyond. You know, we need another. We need a new infrastructure bill passed at the federal level that would then match also, you know, what we've passed at the state level to really, you know, really do some big projects. Because that's, I mean, those there's projects that are, you know, that we're going to need billions for, and that's tough for any state on their own to do. So that's where the feds come in. And but I think um, one of the challenges is. Um, the funding sources. So uh, raising the gas tax seems to always be the third rail, right? Everything's tied to that. Um, there could be more tolling, but that's still being explored, you know, or some type of, you know, if you use the road, you got to pay for it. And then there's then there's the whole thing that that's not been figured out is how are you going to um, how are you going to tax electric vehicles? As more vehicles go electric. Um, you know, how do you, how do you account for them, their use on the road as well? So those are, I mean, it's, um, in some ways in transportation right now, the times are, you know, as things get funded, will be as exciting as when Eisenhower did the expressways back in the fifties, right? That was like the big heyday for transportation and we built all of these incredible expressways in addition to new transit lines. But now things are changing because we're switching to, you know, probably more to electric vehicles. Roads are going to be smarter. Not only are the cars getting smarter, we're looking at making the roads smarter and all the eye of safety as well as improving commute times because people don't want to sit in a car 
house. Or, you know, like my two kids, they don't want to buy a car. They don't ever want to own a car. So <laughs> how is that going to work? Can the, you know, can the roads handle all those Ubers? So it's really, um, it's exciting times now to be in transportation because um, it's going to be interesting to see how this all shakes out. Yeah, it really is. And it seems like things are, are changing. Um, well, obviously a lot faster than they, they have been, right? It's been pretty steady, I think, over... Right. Since, since the highways were all built out and then it was... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Around them and then, but now... It, it, it all depends, I guess, on your perspective as well, because you're right with some of these things with electric vehicles come in, you know, maybe fat. Well, I was going to say faster than some projections, but overall, it's always been slower, right? It's, right. Like, it's been it's taken more and more. There's been plenty of time to plan, but still not that much work maybe necessarily done in the, uh, in realizing that, yeah, with the gas tax that, that pays for so much of the, the highways or these electric vehicles are still using the roads uh, just right? to cross. They're yep. just paying that the tax. Yep. So that's a uh, yeah, an opportunity and uh, and uh, and a concern. I mean, it's great. Yes, thing. and the other thing is with the electric vehicles is, you know, how do you balance it so that the grid can handle it? Because that could be a huge, huge drain on the grid if it it does does go too fast. So how do you balance? The use, you know, when people are charging, it's um, it's it's like I said, it's kind of the wild, wild west with some of this stuff. <laughs> you know, everybody's yeah, trying to figure it out. And and some of that too, like the the grid planning, is that right? I saw like an article on your website when I was doing a little research um, in terms of sharing of electricity across um, different capacity. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, kind of looking at the back of the room stuff as to um, how you know how do you balance it so you don't have to do a complete new grid, but figure out whether it is optimal charging times, you know, um, and where you charge and when you charge, you know, because there's a big thing now with it's so funny because you buy an electric car and right now you charge it like you're gonna like you're at your gas you know at a gas station, right? You have the same thing like a instead of the handle of gas, it is a charger handle, right? And you open the door, like, in reality, um, there are, you know, startups looking at static charging where you were to, let's say you pull up in a parking spot and you're over um, a circular charging and it charges your vehicle that way, right? So it's just charging as you park. You don't have to open anything up. Or, and what's really exciting is the, the, the dynamic charging that um, we are working with a, um, with a group out in the University of Utah where you charge, you ride over a charging station as you're driving, right? So let's say you're on the expressway, you could ultimately maybe have all the expressway system outfitted. So as you're driving, your vehicle gets charged and it would charge you like a toll. Right? How cool would that be? Because then you literally could probably drive across the country and not stop, <laughs> except right. for bathroom breaks. <laughs> so, <laughs> good. I mean, there's just some really cool stuff out there, and it'll just be, and it's kind of interesting. Is like, which charging are we gonna, are we gonna settle on? Is it like, you know, beta versus VHS, <laughs> where we're gonna have a universal one? You know, you got Tesla working on stuff. You got the other car companies working on stuff. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's pretty yeah, cool it's, to see all this stuff. Yeah, interesting to see how that sausage is made. It's uh yes. You know, <laughs> just, <clears throat> sometimes it feels like it's yeah, it's taking too long. And the next thing you know, it's kind of like the it's with the electrical car the electric cars, right? Everybody was like they saw them coming for decades and then all of a sudden now they're here and it's happening fast, right? And Yes, now, yeah. Now they're yeah. all rushing, trying to rush their vehicles out after. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I think some of them are saying we're just going to be electric by 2022, which is a huge statement. <laughs> who said that? That's a big statement. I think, I think it was Jaguar who said that that's really? by 2022, they were going to be all electric. Yeah, so. that's like around the corner. Yeah, exactly. We're basically there. We're basically there. 
Okay, yes. well, is there anything else you want to make sure we uh, thought on while, while we have it here? Um, I think, well, it is infrastructure, uh, infrastructure Week, so happy Infrastructure Week. Yeah, what does that <laughs> well, mean? To, probably uh, all the engineers uh, celebrated. You know, that, uh, <laughs> you know, that can be a, uh, that has all sorts of different connotations. <laughs> all right. <laughs> infrastructure Awareness. Yeah. <laughs> for everybody to appreciate it. I think everybody yeah, does. It's just right. not something that's that right. <laughs> everybody right. talks about. Yeah, I don't know what uh, you know what, what that means in today's day and age, and trying to look for real progress there. I think that with uh, you know needing to uh, yeah get beyond this election, and uh, and I guess we pick it up from there. But there's a lot of heavy lifting to be done, Lord knows, um, to try to yes, there is get, get the pieces in, in in play. And, you know, hopefully it's not too much to ask to, to accomplish some big goals and for people to, to come together for the greater good um, because there's, uh, there's a lot of work that does need to be done, so. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree, it's a great. All right, well on that note, um, okay. thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate you coming on and uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Okay, thank you. Take care.